Hello, everyone. I'm Carolyn Waters, the director and head librarian here at the New York Society Library. We are absolutely delighted um, to be um, here presenting this program with uh, poet and critic A.E. Stallings on Freeze Frame, um, uh, artists and the in the debate around the Elgin Marbles. But of course, we're also celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Hudson Review. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this is not the first time we've hosted an event with the uh, Hudson Review, but, um, but it, is, it is always a thrill. And 75 years is really quite incredible. So we are, we are thrilled once again to have Paula Dietz and her wonderful staff and her, the many admirers of the Hudson Review here. Um, I am just here to welcome you, but I want to take just one minute for some of you who may not uh, be familiar with the New York Society Library to tell you a little bit about us. Um, we are the oldest library and cultural institution in New York City, founded in 1754. So just a little bit older than the Hudson Review. Um, we, um, we have been, uh, we are open to all. Um, we have been fortunate over our years to count among our members many of the founding fathers of the United States and many eminent writers like Herman Melville and Willa Cather, and David Halberstam, Gregory Pardlow, Tom Wolfe, uh, Juna Barnes, um, Stacy Schiff, um, you name it, we have uh, a roster of wonderful members, uh, member writers. Um, but we have been um, open to all and accept members and, uh, and have uh, supported writers and New Yorkers of all stripes over the years. Um, as I mentioned, we are open to all. Anyone can become a member to uh, use our reading and writing spaces and to access our open book stacks, 12 floors of open book stacks. It's glorious. Um, but even non-members can use the library to attend events like tonight's, uh, to uh, come and see our exhibitions and to uh, consult books from our stacks. We're happy to pull them for you so that you can use them here in the library. So if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask us or come in for a tour. We're happy to show people around. Um, so without further ado, I want to hand the podium over to one of our favorite people, the editor of the Hudson Review, Paula Dietz. Welcome, everybody. I mean, it, it really has been a thrill. I think we've, we've celebrated many different anniversaries, and uh, I hope we can continue to come here, because we really love it. I, and also, in my early years of doing journalism, this is always my secret weapon. This, I mean, people would say, how did you find that out? I'd always say, you wrote that article, and how did you find out that fact? And, and this was it. It was because I went to the stacks and you know, found exactly the right book. So my warmest thanks to uh, Carolyn Waters and also to Sarah Holliday, who was here with us, the events coordinator, for hosting the Hudson Review over many years. And this, time, this is really our final event now, celebrating the 75th anniversary, which was founded in 1948. And we are indeed very fortunate to have our speaker, the poet, essayist, classicist, and translator, Alicia Stallings whose literary themes really range from modernity to antiquity. As many of you may already know, as of October 9, Alicia began a four-year term as the Oxford Professorship of Poetry, considered really the pinnacle of the uh, poetry world. And this honor has you know, already been preceded by many others, including the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Barnstone Translation Prize. She was born in Decatur, Georgia, but she now lives with her family in Athens, Greece. And since 2002, the Hudson Review has published her poems, translations of Lucretius, essays, letters from Greece, and especially in 2018, actually in our previous anniversary issue, she did a log, a log book, day by day, of her work with refugees flowing into Greece, highlighting a special seminar she gave to bring women 
the refugee women into her literary world. Her latest book is a selected poems titled This Afterlife and was preceded by four collections, including Like, the most recent one. Uh, following her book, following her talk, her books are available for sale. All these books are being sold downstairs on the ground floor, uh, including her most recent collection before the selected poems entitled Like, and also piles of the Hudson Review with the original article in it and the anniversary issue. And I just want to say that in every issue, there is a subscription form. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, when I was organizing this special anniversary issue, I actually wrote to Alicia just to ask her what she was working on. And she responded that she was writing an essay that was too long for a magazine and too short for a book. And I wrote back and said, it sounds just right to me. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen, Alicia Stallings on the Elgin Marbles. Thank you. Oops, let me raise this a little bit. Um, can everyone hear me? Um, thank you um, to the New York Society Library, um, to Paula um, for having faith in this kind of odd project which began as a series of obsessive rabbit holes um, during the lockdowns in Greece, um, to Ron, um, Corey also, and to Catherine, the fact checker, who had her work cut out for her, and so did I. Um, so yes, I kind of, I, this began as a blog post that got completely out of control um, and just got worse and worse, um, but, uh, but was a lot of fun for me to explore and I hope will be fun. I'm really, it's, a very, it's something like 40,000 words. I'm obviously not gonna read all of those words, um, but I'm just gonna scratch the surface. Uh, but if you want to learn more, I would say, um, get the magazine and subscribe to the magazine. Um, so uh, this, I should add, is a, a wonderful photograph of Frederick Morgan, one of the founding editors of the Hudson Review. And I was just really fascinated to see this beautiful picture of the horse head of Cellini, um, a replica next to the sea where I think, um, where I think Cellini belongs. This background, which might look like a sunset, is actually a very close, almost microscopic close-up of what pendelic marble looks like. So I'm going to start by reading, and then I'm going to go a bit off-piste. Um, shadows and magnitude. It is often easy to forget that when John Keats wrote his often anthologized sonnet on seeing the Elgin marbles in 1817, the eponymous marbles were relatively new immigrants to England. Um, I'm gonna do a little bracket, what we say in Greece, opening some parentheses. Um, 1817 um, was immediately preceded, obviously, by 1816. 1816 um, is the year without a summer. Um, many of you all may have heard of that from the history of writing, the writing of Frankenstein, um, where it was dark and cold and rainy. Um, so people wrote things about monsters. Um, crops failed. Um, 1815, uh, right before that, um, is the Battle of Waterloo. So there's a lot going on in the air, and we're going to get on to more of that. But um, the marbles retained a spark of the recent controversy. They were the source of public and parliamentary debate a year before they had only just been unveiled to the general public in the British Museum. The poem light on observed detail and heavy on high romantic swoon, seems more a hymn to Stendhal syndrome than a description of an actual artistic encounter. My spirit is too weak. Mortality weighs heavily on me like unwilling sleep, and each imagined pinnacle and steep of godlike hardship tells me I must die, like a sick eagle looking at the sky. Yet tis a gentle luxury to weep, that I have not the cloudy winds to keep fresh for the opening of the morning's eye. Such dim conceived glories of the brain bring round the heart an indescribable feud, 
so do these wonders a most dizzy pain that mingles Grecian grandeur with the rude wasting of old time with a billowy mane, a sun, a shadow of a magnitude. Without the title, it would be very hard to guess what these wonders refer to at all. Only godlike and Grecian, maybe at a stretch old time, even gesture at their general direction. Whence the pinnacles and steeps, or the eagle and the sun, an imagined Greek setting, Greek sun and sea, are trucked into the cool, dim salon of the British Museum's temporary Elgin room by the imagination. Very importantly, and we kind of know essentially what date this is, um, this is either, I think, March 1st or 2nd of 1817, because he immediately tosses off two sonnets, sends them to Lee Hunt's examiner, and they're published about a week later. Keats had not been alone on this visit. His friend, the irascible and erudite painter, Benjamin Hayden, had served as an enthusiastic docent. Keats dashed off this, summer, this sonnet the same evening and sent it to Hayden while still giddy from the museum experience. It is the second of a brace of sonnets, and the first is addressed to Hayden directly. Forgive me, Hayden, that I cannot speak definitively on these mighty things. Forgive me that I have not eagle's wings, that what I want I know not where to seek, and think that I would not be over meek and rolling out up followed thunderings even to the steep of Heliconian Springs, were I of ample strength for such a freak. Think, too, that all those numbers should be thine. Whose else in this who touched thy vesture's hem? For when men stared at what was most divine with browless idiotism or weaning phlegm, thou hadst beheld the Hesperian shine of their star in the east and gone to worship them. Both sonnets were published, one on top of the other, in Lee Hunt's Examiner, but this sonnet is much less of a keeper, with its vague sweep of Greek geography and unfortunate rhyme word phlegm, <laughs> although here it means stoic calm. But the sonnets do shed light upon one another. The eagle makes an appearance in both, but in this poem, the eagle's wings, this eagle is not too sick to fly, belong to Hayden rather than the speaker. Keats asks forgiveness for not being able to speak definitively, which presumably Hayden can, perhaps thunderingly so. But by the second poem, the vagueness and inability to articulate about the marble fragments becomes an immortal phrase in itself, a shadow of a magnitude. It is irresistible to try to imagine the visit. In fact, I think there's a play about it. Um, with Hayden pontificating and Keats in tow, perhaps dumbfounded. Hayden had been obsessed with the marbles and would continue to be so for the rest of his life, since he first encountered them with his friend, the, a Scottish painter, David Wilkie, nearly a decade earlier in 1808, um, in a damp, dirty penthouse in an open yard on Park Lane, where the marbles had lain within sight and reach. Um, let's see what we have. This, by the way, is where Keats would have seen the marbles, not um, if you've been to the British Museum in the beautiful Duveen Gallery. Um, it is literally the temporary Elgin Room designed by Robert Smirk. You can kind of see it's sort of hammered together with plywood. Um, the marbles are just piled willy-nilly everywhere. The, head, the horse head of Cellini is on the floor. I think it's like sawdust on the floor. Um, so this is a very different... It's a museum experience, but it's very different from what we have probably experienced if you have been to see the marbles. Um, so this is a, a kind of strange way that he would have seen them. Um, so Benjamin Hayden is a failed painter. Um, I think Charles Dickens calls him um, quite marvelous in its badness about his art. Um, he, he's really more known now for a very lively autobiography. Um, he's really more of a writer than an than a, than a artist in some ways. But he recounts the transcendent experience of first laying eyes on the Elgin marbles. He did not see them here. He saw them in um, kind of under a, a tent situation in Park Lane. The first thing I fixed, on my, I fixed my eyes on was the wrist of a figure in one of the female group in which were visible, though in a feminine form, the radius and ulna. I was astonished, for I had never seen them hinted at in any female wrist in the antique. 
I darted my eye to the elbow and saw the outer condyle visibly affecting the shape as in nature. The, that combination of nature and idea, which I had felt was so much wanting for, for high art, was here displayed to midday conviction. My heart beat. I felt the future. I foretold that they would prove themselves the finest things on earth, that they would overturn the false bow ideal where, nothing, where nature was nothing and would establish the true bow ideal of which nature alone is the basis. I felt as if a divine truth had blazed inwardly upon my mind. So they made a big impression on him. Um, and then Hayden says, I do not say this now when all the world acknowledges it, but I said it then when no one would believe me. Um, adding that he was in such a state of excitement when he got home that Wilkie, a Scot, had tried to moderate his enthusiasm with his national caution. Um, at Hayden's next opportunity to visit the marbles, he dragged the Swiss painter, Henry Fusilli, who he had been um, studying with um, as a young artist, with him. And Fusilli endears himself to Hayden forever with his uncompromising enthusiasm, striding around and exclaiming, De Greeks were gods! De Greeks were gods! <laughs> Hayden's own fascination with the marbles and his advocacy for them were contagious, maybe even overwhelming. He was roughly 10 years older than Keats, who was 21 at the time of their bromance, and further embarked on his um, artistic career of ambitious, large-scale historical and biblical paintings. Let's see if I maybe get... Oh, there, here's a Fusilli. That's a really famous one. Um, yeah, so this is a typical um, Benjamin Hayden production. This is quite a famous one. It's Christ entering Jerusalem. Christ looks like a sort of middle manager. There is an awkward, large donkey sucking up all the light. Um, there's a portrait of Wordsworth and Keats um, in here. But if we go back. This is, though, when he first encounters the marbles, he is drawing them. And this is the horse of Cellini that we saw at the beginning. Um, one of the things about the pediment of the marbles is that this is the horse of the moon, who is exhausted after sort of pulling um, the chariot all day, and so um, it's got its her eyes are bug or his eyes are bugging out, and his nostrils are flared. Um, so he's like been ridden wet, you know, ridden hard and put up wet is that kind of look. Um, so Keats, I think, was very um, influenced by this, you know, clearly overwhelming enthusiasm. Hayden's expertise on the marbles and his passion for them seemed to have made as much an impression as the sculptures and marble reliefs. In particular, Hayden would have pointed out to Keats that their beauty lay in their anatomical truth, how the artists understood the inner structures of the human body, whether it was the bones in a woman's forearm or a muscle flexed in the armpit of a struggling torso, details that would hardly have been lost on Keats, who had not only studied anatomy in his surgical training, but still had daily experience of it at Guy's Hospital. Hayden might have called the pediments eagles as a translation of the Greek word etoma, as happened during the parliamentary committee um, in 1816, um, or pointed out the missing eagle under Zeus's throne. He might have recounted some of the marble's misadventures, one shipment of which on Lord Elgin's brig, the Mentor, sank in 1802 in rough seas off of Kithra. That's actually the sort of main uh, group of them. The humans aboard were unscathed, but 17 crates of sculptures ended up at the bottom of the billowy main, rescued over the next two years with the help of hired Greek sponge divers brought in from Simi and Kalamnos. This adds to all of the money that Elgin ends up spending on the marbles and wants to later get back recoup from the British government. Hayden would have waxed, waxed lyrical about the perfection glimpsed through the fragmentary. This is a point of time um, when the idea of beauty, of the perfect beauty, uh, would be, where is my Apollo Belvedere? Maybe I don't have it. All right. What's the Apollo Belvedere? The, and, so, and the idea was that um, things needed to be finished, um, not incomplete or fragmentary to be beautiful, but um, Hayden thought that the fragmentary was equally beautiful. Um, so 
It was also exactly one year on um, from the meetings of the House of Commons Select Committee and Parliamentary Debate on whether to purchase the marbles. I think this is the first and almost only case um, where a government decides um, whether, uh, how much something is worth, how much to pay for it, and whether it was gotten um, ethically. I won't say legally. Um, Hayden had been furious at the snub of not being invited to testify. So they had a lot of artists and experts come to testify and had taken to the pages of Lee Hunt's examiner to fulminate in particularly targeting Richard Payne Knight, whose testimony, whose testimony had held that the marbles were of second rank, that the lot was worth on the open market of fractions of Elgin's asking price, the not inconsiderable sum of 73,600 pounds, roughly six million in today's money, although it's really very hard to determine that. Um, Hayden's screed was entitled on the judgment of connoisseurs being preferred to that of professional men and contained the zinger, no man will trust his limb to a connoisseur in surgery. <laughs> so in no part of Keats's Elgin Marbles sonnet does he describe the marbles directly, but rather the overwhelming emotion of encountering them. But there does seem to be a description in Keats of the marbles themselves. And that is a more ambitious poem a couple of years later, Ode on a Grecian Urn in which those emotions are recollected in tranquility. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O oh, mysterious priest, leadst thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? The southern frieze has many blocks that depict people leading animals to sacrifice, um, and in particular, one southern block depicts a heifer bellowing at the sky. And other parts of the poem have counterparts in the frieze as well. It may be assumed that the figures in Keats' poem are addressing an unmated, are sacrificing an unmated female animal to a virgin goddess, Athena perhaps. Um, and the end of that poem, as you all know, goes, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. The voice Keats hears, imagining what the Grecian urn would say, sounds a lot like Hayden. Um, the Elgin marbles, as Keats refers to them, consists of roughly half of the Parthenon surviving ornaments, 247 feet of 520 feet of the frieze, 15 of the 92 surviving metopes, and 17 pedimental, pedimental figures, as well as architectural elements from the Parthenon, such as a Doric capital that was so large that it had to be cut in two to get through the gate. That, at that point, um, the Acropolis was a fortified uh, area. And from other buildings on the Acropolis, such as a caryatid from the Erechtheon. These were removed from the Acropolis by agents of Thomas Bruce, Lord Elgin, mostly in a frenetic burst of activity from 1801 to 1803. There was an injunction against further excavations Elgin's agents were planning to remove the Western Frieze, and that was issued by an Ottoman governor of Athens in 1805. Um, he had been kind of told what Elgin was planning. So the removal of the Western Frieze um, would have involved destroying an intact wall. Um, and he was sort of put on his guard by the French ambassador who wanted to take them to the Louvre. It would take another decade to ship all of the marbles out of Greece to England. It is worth, um, I would just say here is, um, this is Hayden's sketch. One of the things you might note is the sharpness of detail. Um, and this is the Cellini head as it is now and after a rather catastrophic um, cleaning. Um, it is worth noting that these marbles taken from the Parthenon, as we said, were fragmentary, fragmentary but not because of the rude wasting of old time, but the violent intervention of man. The Parthenon had stood virtually intact from its completion in 432 BC. In fact, it only took nine years to build. That's pretty amazing. Um, and aside from the destruction of its original roof, um, and there was some removal and destruction of sculptures by um, early Christians who were obviously shocked at these pagan images, um, but largely it was intact. That changed in a flash on the night of September 26, in the wee hours of the 27th in 1687. 
Let's see if we get this. Where is it? I think I have an explosion here. Where's my explosion? Maybe this is an older version. All right. When a Venetian um, general, Francesco Morosini, at war with the Ottoman Turks, fired on the temple with his cannons from the Philippopos Hill opposite. Morosini was a flamboyant character. He always wore red from head to toe, and he never went into battle without his beloved cat, Nini. <laughs> he later even had Nini mummified. You can go see Nini in Venice. And he loved Nini so much that he mummified him or her, I do not know, with a rat so, um, or a mouse. So it could have something to do in the afterlife. Someone needs, obviously, to write a children's book about the explosion of the Parthenon from the point of view of Morosini's cat. So Hayden had wanted them, the marbles to be acquired. Oh, wait, here's the, here's the explosion. Oh, yeah, there. So this is a very early etching, um, the Acropolis intact, and the cannonball, that of course, blew up because it was being used as a powder magazine. There were 300-some-odd women and children who were in there for protection and who were all killed. Um, you can, um, you, if he had shot directly at the temple, the cellar walls, the internal walls, and the columns were probably too heavy for even a cannonball to do very much. But he knew that the weak point was the roof. So this was deliberately lodged, lobbed over onto the roof where it fell down and exploded everything. So just tons and tons of pandelic marble, sculptures, everything raining everywhere. Um, so Hayden had wanted the government to acquire the marbles. He hoped they would benefit British artists and the British public at large, forming the basis of a new school of art. Um, Keats kind of writes these poems that museumify the marbles. It's kind of a new thing that they're suddenly in a museum. Um, but there is another British poet who is very important to the discussion of the marbles, and that is Lord Byron. Keats would have been well aware that many even in the UK, saw their removal from the Parthenon as despoliation and a crime. They had played into those debates of the previous year, but were also, um, there was a view vehemently expressed by Lord Byron in the second canto of Child Harold's Pilgrimage, a wildly popular bestseller that Keats was certain to have digested. The first two cantos came out in 1812 and went through 10 editions in the next three weeks. I mean, imagine that for poetry. <laughs> that would still be just completely amazing. Um, Byron became a celebrity overnight. I awoke one morning and found myself famous. One of the things that Byron cannot forgive Elgin for is being Scottish. <laughs> Byron had Scottish connections and, like Byron, a lord. And here in these cantos, Byron dismisses him as a picked. But most the modern Picts ignoble boast to rive what Goth and Turk and time hath spared. Cold as the crags upon his native coast, his mind as barren and his heart as hard. Is he whose head conceived, whose hand prepared, ought to displace Athena's poor remains, her sons, these are the Greeks, too weak, the sacred shine, shrine to guard, yet felt some portion of their mother's pains and never knew till then the weight of despots' chains. And it goes on in this vein. It's kind of the first idea um, that the Greeks, who are not in charge of Athens at this time, of course Greece is part of the Ottoman Empire, um, uh, are personally affronted. Um, by this destruction of the ornaments or taking of the ornaments of the marbles, something that continues to be debated to this day. Byron, who left England in 1816 never to return, would never see the marbles in their British Museum setting. He was not, for that matter, much interested in antiquities the way many of his contemporaries were. Um, and in English bards and Scotch reviewers, he dis dismisses the marbles as Phidian freaks and elsewhere remarks pointedly that he is not a collector, as almost everyone was. But he does seem to have seen the collection in London, in the cold, dark, damp shed where Hayden first encountered them at Elgin's house at the corner of Park Lane and Piccadilly. That's, whoops, that's that. So this is even more chaotic. I just need to get some water. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> even more chaotic, thank you. 
than the um, temporary Elgin rooms. This is more temporary than the temporary Elgin rooms. <coughs> There's some kind of very flimsy plywood shed or tent over them. Things are lying about willy-nilly. There we see the horse head on a random column. Um, and Elgin had, took a, had taken a bunch of stuff, not just um, the stuff we think about. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so at this point, we might rewind just a little bit. Um, how and why does Elgin get the marbles in the first place? I'm not going to enter into the Fermont and the legal things, um, but what is really probably most important uh, is this person, Sir Horatio Nelson. Um, in 1798, if we rewind a couple of years before 1801, um, Napoleon wanted to invade Egypt, which was nominally under the Ottoman Empire, although enjoyed a great deal of autonomy, um, and probably as a way to go further into British India. And he's basically stopped at the Battle of the Nile in um, August of 1798 by Sir Horatio Nelson. So this very much changes the course of history and the war. Um, the Ottoman Empire is very, very happy about this. Um, and in fact, if you look at the, that thing on his hat, um, which is called, and other people will know how to pronounce it better than I, an aigrette, does that sound right? Um, is actually an official Ottoman um, medal. It was awarded to him uh, by Sultan Selim III um, in Turkish. It's called a chelenk. Again, I can't pronounce it. Um, and he is the first non-Ottoman person to receive this military award. Um, it's all diamonds. Um, uh, in fact, the central diamond and the four diamonds around it were estimated to be worth a thousand pounds at that time, so I think you can multiply by a hundred, but probably more. And there are many, many other diamonds besides. Um, it no longer exists um, because, as with the Elgin marbles, everything touches upon them. Um, and it was stolen in 1951 um, from a museum by uh, George Taters Chatham very famous uh, British thief who then sold it um, on the black market for a couple thousand pounds and it was broken up into pieces. Um, <laughs> but anyway, you get an idea of how um, special and important this was to the Ottoman Empire. Um, who directly, directly after this battle gets promoted to ambassador, um, British ambassador to Constantinople? That would be our friend, Lord Elgin. So he is in a very good position if he wants to ask for favors. That is somewhat controversial and will, and will feed into the parliamentary debate. Um, whoops. Oh, here's Salim. And you see, he's got an egret too. You're really supposed to wear it on a turban, not a three-corner hat. But um, yeah. So it looks better. On, well, I don't know. It's more dashing. I don't, it's hard to say. Um, this is Lord Elgin on your right. Um, he was a lord, but not very wealthy. He married a very beautiful heiress, Mary Nisbet, shortly again, um, right after um, this Battle of the Nile, or maybe right after he's made ambassador. This is, I think, the only portrait we have of Lord Elgin. There are no more after this um, because his nose falls off. Um, <laughs> so, so I, one should not laugh. Um, some say it was syphilis. He felt that, you know, that was insulting and he claimed it was an infection. Um, people, um, including Byron, made fun of this. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of like, oh, well, you like no uh, marbles without noses. Is that because you don't have a nose? Um, anyway, generally Elgin's um, fortunes take a turn for the worse after he takes the marbles down. And Byron writes this poem called The Curse of Minerva, where he's like, if you take these things, there's going to be a curse upon you, and you're going to lose India, and Brexit's going to happen. And he protects everything. <laughs> Again, you laugh. I say Google it. Um, so he, he does acquire them at great personal expense. He ends up eventually divorced from Lady, Lady Nisbet in a quite fantastically celebrity famous divorce. Um, and so he's left with all of these marbles, which he cannot sell. 
Uh, he wants to, he does want to keep them together. His original, though, view of the marbles is he wanted them to decorate his home in Broom Hall um, because he had this wonderful new bride, and he even left um, spaces for columns and random marble ornaments. Obviously, um, the Acropolis was a great source of that. Uh, yes, his, Elgin writes of Broom Hall from Constantinople to the painter he has employed, Giovanni Battisti. Battista Lucieri. The building, this building is a subject that occupies me greatly and offers me the means of placing in a useful, distinguished, and agreeable way the various things that you may perhaps be able to procure for me. The hall is intended to be adorned with columns. The cellars underneath are vaulted expressly for this. One can easily multiply ornaments of beautiful marble without overdoing it. And nothing truly is so beautiful and also independent of changes of fashion. That's true. These reflections only apply to unworked marble. You do not need any prompting from me to know the piece that is attached to a sculptured marble or a historic piece. Um, so this is definitely what is on his mind originally. Uh, he then ends up with this uh, bunch of marbles, which he cannot sell, and um, he is completely, completely broke at this point. Um, so he hits upon this idea of charging tickets for people to look at them. That also is not very profitable. Um, he, they, again, they're not famous. They're these random things that are broken that have shown up in London. So what he hits upon, oh, where am I? He hits upon the idea of doing kind of happenings. So you need to picture this. Um, Byron, who left, uh, left England, never returned, didn't, um, having acquired the marbles at great personal expense, or at any rate at the expense of his now ex-wife's considerable fortune, and although um, he listed them as of no value to custom them through customs, this comes up too, uh, Elgin now needed to demonstrate their aesthetic and financial worth to sell them at a good price to the government and ext extricate himself from debt. He hit upon linking the unloved Parthenon statues to the wildly popular British sport of boxing and gained a little income by charging for admission. In 1808, one scheme involved having the English national champion, the six foot two prize fighter Bob Gregson, pose naked for two hours in attitudes similar to the sculptures so people could compare the physiques. The implication was that a fit British body in fighting form was the natural modern expression of idealized Greek masculine beauty. Consider for a moment the scene. Men and women of society being able to admire or ogle a ripped and naked body at close quarters in a dim shed against a convenient background of respectable cultural significance. <laughs> Imagine, say, Jane Austen's Captain Wentworth still disappointed in the year eight happening upon the spectacle alongside Regency bucks like Rod and Crawley, or Anne Elliot for that matter. It's a scene worthy of Bridgerton. Celebrities, including the renowned Shakespearean actress Mrs. Siddons, flocked to the marbles in the shed. The actress famously was supposed to have been moved to tears in their presence. Um, Elgin followed up the success of this with other popular happenings, including actual boxing matches. Okay, there, imagine, there's a boxing match. There are like fingers and things that can get broken off um, with the most famous boxers of the day. Maybe museums should think of this to get people in. Um, one show in July of 1808 boasted three pairs of celebrity fighters, including John Gully, a popular prize fighter, John Jackson, who was not only the prize fighting champion of Britain, but Byron's personal trainer, Jim Belcher, a bare knuckle fighter who had been champion of all England, and Dutch Sam, the man with the iron hand, whose physique was considered especially symmetrical and Grecian. Um, Byron no doubt witnessed at least one of these events, Byron numbered many pugilists among his friends, not only his trainer, but the heavyweight boxer Tom Cribb, who also participated in one of these bouts. He immortalizes the titillating, sex-saturated atmosphere, part art opening, part underground rave, part nightclub, 
in his verse diatribe against Lord Elgin's removal of the sculptures, The Curse of Minerva. Um, he never published The Curse of Minerva. It, he only sent out like f eight copies um, to friends because he was warned by friends of Elgin that it was libelous. Basically, it suggests that one of his children is um, illegitimate, so you know you get sued for that. But this bit just um, describes one of these happenings. Be all the bruisers culled from all St. Giles, that art and nature may compare their styles. While brawny brutes in stupid wonder stare and marvel at his lordship's stone shop, his lordship's stone shop there, round the thronged gate shall sauntering coxcrombs creep to lounge and lucubrate, to prate and peep, while many a languid maid with longing eye on giant statues casts the curious eye. The room with transient glance appears to skim, yet marks the mighty back and length of limb, mourns o'er the difference of now and then, exclaims, these Greeks indeed were proper men. Draw slight comparisons of these with those, and envies Laius all her attic bows. When shall a modern maid have swains like these? Alas, Sir Harry is no Hercules. And last of all, amidst the gaping crew, some calm spectator, as he takes his view in silent indignation, mixed with grief, admires the plunder, but abhors the thief. Um, Byron's own notes to the poem explain the boxers marveling at the stone shop with, poor Tom Cribb was sadly puzzled when the marbles were first exhibited at Elgin House. He asked if it was not a stone shop. He was right. It is a shop. And I think we can be little doubt that that calm spectator at the end of the satirical scene, um, where it is the audience rather than the marbles that is so closely observed, is Byron himself, astounded into melancholy speechlessness, admiring the plunder and abhorring the thief. Um, so we have to imagine those scenes. One of the things that has happened then um, at this particular time period, um, we have the Battle of the Nile that sets the scene, um, and then in 1815 we have Waterloo. Um, so there becomes a sense uh, among the Brits that um, Napoleon sort of is associated with an Eastern despot um, like the Persians, so he's Xerxes or Darius. And then who should be the Athenians? Why, it is the Brits themselves. And so um, not only are they the proper uh, place for a Parthenon, they are the proper place for the Parthenon. <laughs> um, so people like uh, Wordsworth, whom Byron called Turdsworth, <laughs> and also Wordsworths. <laughs> <laughs> um, wrote, you know, really cringeworthy things, you know, um, Pindaric Ode composed in January 18, 1816. Um, Victorious England, bid the silent art reflect in glowing hues that shall not fade those high achievements, even as she arrayed with second life the deed of Marathon upon Athenian walls, so she may labor for thy civic halls and by, be the guardian spaces of consecrated places as nobly graced by sculpture's patient toil and let imperishable structures grow fixed in the depths of this courageous soil. Um, you know, and obviously uh, that courageous soil is England. Um, there's actually a very famous dinner party where Hayden um, Keats Wordsworth and a number of other people are present um, called the Immortal Dinner, um, which must have been fun. Um, so Hayden has one association with the marbles, but there is another painter um, for Hayden that is maybe more important. Um, when, uh, okay, this is a watercolor drawing by Lucieri. Um, Elkin wanted to bring artists with him to model and paint all of these antiquities. He first tried to get Turner and um, didn't pay enough. So the whole history of the marbles would have been different if Turner had said yes, because he would have probably just drawn them and not taken them off the building. Um, Lucieri is a much better painter um, than Hayden is. He was a sort of minor master and I think kind of became resentful. He could have, you know, 
been something if he had not been Elgin's agent. This is his own drawing of this, or yeah, drawing of the southeast corner of the Parthenon before it was kind of destroyed. Uh, so one of the first things he starts taking is these metopes. They weren't so interested in the frieze, which was kind of an unknown quantity, but everyone wanted to get hold of these highly carved metopes, which largely show a battle between the lapiths and the centaurs and are quite handsome. So um, he started to extract them almost like teeth. They had huge saws because these blocks are just enormous. You couldn't take one of those whole blocks off of the Parthenon. They saw the sort of front half. They have to pull them up like teeth. But he could not do that in the corner. So what did he do? He knocked the cornice off. There were quite a lot of um, eyewitnesses to some of these damages of the building. Uh, whatever permissions... Um, that Elgin may or may not have received, I think it is pretty clear that they were not intended to be damaged to the building itself. Um, the Ottomans were quite, well, for one thing, in the center of here, there's a mosque, and it had been a mosque when it blew up. This is around Byron's time. Um, you see the little uh, mosque in there. But when Morosini blew the temple up, the whole temple was a mosque and was considered one of the most beautiful mosques in the world. Um, it's a sacred space. I'm not sure that the Ottomans would be very keen on it being dismantled, whatever else one might say. There were many eyewitnesses, many English eyewitnesses on that day. In fact, one of them is Dodwell, who is, I think, responsible for this painting. What I like here is you can see um, the guys um, lowering bits of marble, one piece gets smashed. You can see the distar, who is the Ottoman official in charge of the fortress up there. And you can see someone in a hat, I think that's probably Lucieri, the artist, who is um, managing uh, the business. Um, when the, this is Edward Daniel Clark in a letter. Um, when the last of the metopes was taken from the Parthenon and in the moving of it, a great part of the superstructure with one of the triglyphs was thrown down by the workman whom Lord Elgin employed, the distar who beheld the mischief done to the building, took his pipe from his mouth, dropped a tear, and in a supplicating tone of voice said to Lucieri, telos, um, which is Greek for stop it, the end, finished, don't do it anymore. Um, uh, Dodwell, who's picture this is, um, during my first tour to Greece, I had the inexpressible mortification of being present when the Parthenon was despoiled of its finest sculpture and when some of its architectural members were thrown to the ground. I saw several metope at the southeast extremity, that's this, of the temple taken down. They were fixed in between the triglyphs as in a groove, and in order to lift them up, it was necessary to throw to the ground the magnificent cornice by which they were covered. The southeast angle of the pediment shared the same fate, and instead of the picturesque beauty and high preservation in which I first saw it, it is now comparatively reduced to a state of shattered desolation. Um, another eyewitness, so there were several people up on the rock at this point, was Robert Smirk. Uh, we remember Robert Smirk. He is the designer of the temporary Elgin Room. He was a young artist and ar uh, architect who made some accomplished sketches of the Parthenon. He was also deeply moved by viewing the Greek temples in person, um, and he witnessed this event. It particularly affected me when I saw the destruction made to get down the basso relievos on the wall, men laboring with iron crowbars to move the stones of these firm-built walls. Each stone, as it fell, shook the ground with its ponderous weight, with a deep, hollow noise, it seemed like a convulsive groan of the injured spirit of the temple. Um, he will go on to design this, which we know is the front of the British Museum. Um, and, you know, he brings this kind of Greek revival. Uh, you'll have descriptions of it that it sort of refers to various Greek temples, and it is a bit of a pastiche. Um, but clearly there is a way of framing the marbles of the Parthenon within kind of a second Parthenon or a second Greek temple. I think these are 44 columns rather than the 46 columns um, of the Parthenon, and they are tall, skinny, ionic columns rather than the kind of sturdy Doric columns of the Parthenon. He is able to do this in London because he kind of almost invents, or he's one of the first users of concrete foundations. Um, so he has very much a, 
um, a hand in bringing this, but it's, you know, there's something he has, he has personally witnessed, um, the Parthenon being changed. Um, this is a popular cartoon from the time in 1816 because people were absolutely scandalized when the British government did pay for the marbles. They paid about 35,000 pounds, um, which is maybe like three million something in our money. Um, although again, that is very hard to establish and there, you can swing very widely in either direction. Um, but people at the time were very upset because there were veterans from Waterloo who were not getting their pensions. Um, people were suffering from crop failures. And what is the government doing? It is buying broken stones. What is with that? Um, so it was not necessarily popular. Um, as uh, one of the things that the Again, I'm going to just be able to scratch the surface. Um, but almost immediately, uh, the Parthenon marbles get dragged into almost all of the debates of the day. Oh, this, by the way, is one of Lucieri's um, paintings. Most of his work does not survive because it sank on a ship um, being shipped back to Elgin. Um, but we have a few pieces there, mostly in the um, National Gallery of Scotland. This is an urn that he found, a Grecian urn, a bronze urn within a stone urn. Um, that had some remains and a golden crown in it. Um, but as you can see, the kind of wonderful um, detail. And he's kind of the opposite of Hayden. So when he, he was very famous for doing, for instance, um, landscapes of Mount Etna, but the temptation of Hayden would be to make that a historical drama and you know, people dying and, and so on. And he totally resists that and just shows you know, modern Mount Etna. So he has, he has kind of better taste than Hayden, but it's ultimately he who takes down most of the things off of the Parthenon. But almost immediately, um, so they were starting to understand even then that the marbles were probably not white, but had been painted. Um, but even many years later, when that has been totally established, a painting like this um, by Alma Talita uh, was very shocking to the Victorians. Um, this is supposed to be Phidias um, in his workshop, showing um, uh, Pericles and Aspasia what this wonderful thing that they have built is, and it's very highly colored with dark Mediterranean flesh tones, all very, very, very shocking. Um, because what people wanted from the marbles almost immediately um, they tied it into race theory. Um, they represented the true European ideal, which the Greeks had clearly fallen from. Um, so the thing that the marbles most represented was your British man on the street. Um, Hayden was part of that debate. He was fascinated. There was a um, sailor from Boston that we only know as Wilson, um, a, a free American sailor. Wilson, uh, Hayden was quite obsessed with his physique, particularly the backside of his physique. Um, so much so that he did a plaster cast of this poor man and the man nearly died because the plaster seized up and then he couldn't breathe. Um, Hayden did rescue him. Um, this is another painter, uh, George Daw, who also painted him. So Wilson told a story of having, you know, had some encounter with a buffalo. Uh, but it gets painted as a kind of, he has to be naked, like he's a savage, and um, there are all kinds of racial overtones. Um, Hayden was very fascinated with the backside, um, but didn't like his facial features, and there's all of this debate that, again, the marbles are drawn into. Um, so they become really kind of this lightning rod for debate on race. And then, you know, later when Duveen donates a million pounds for a brand new gallery, the one we see them in, this beautiful, um, very cool gallery uh, that is the exact proportions of the Parthenon. The main thing he wanted, Duveen was a famous um, seller of art to newly minted American millionaires. And what he would do is he would buy up old masters, scrape the varnish off them, sometimes trim them, um, and uh, then sell them for more money. So the thing he wanted with the marbles was that they be scrubbed white, 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 white. This was done with carborundum and sometimes copper brushes, things you would not use on your cast iron skillet. Um, and it became quite the controversy. So this is how it's displayed. You'll see that the frieze 
um, which on the temple would have been facing out. It's what we call an ionic frieze, which means it's kind of a continuous strip, like a cartoon. Um, and if you're walking around the temple, you can almost see the procession. This would be the closest thing you would have to animation. See people get ready with the horses and process um, to where they're giving something to the goddess. The British Museum, as you see, has it facing inward. Um, it is missing about half of the frieze, but you would not know that from how it is positioned. Um, one of the things that the Acropolis Museum that has done that's kind of interesting is they have, they have everything in there that we know about, um, but where the museum itself does not have them, they are in white plaster. So it's kind of a strange case where um, white plast whiteness represents not authenticity or purity, but falseness and um, artifice. So it's a very interesting um, way that they have so here we have the caryatid um, that Elgin took from the Erechtheon, which was held up by six caryatides. He left um, a pile of bricks in her place, which really shocked people. This was a very beloved monument. Um, visitors did not come to Greece to see a pile of bricks. <laughs> so everyone was kind of upset about her. Um, this is why I kind of... I. I'm not, I don't have a problem with calling the Elgin marbles the Elgin marbles because there are marbles that are not from the Parthenon that he took. And I think they have um, kind of gone on a different historical path. Interestingly, the British Museum itself has scrubbed poor Elgin's name um, from the exhibit. So he's lost his fortune. He's lost his nose. He dies in debt. And, you know, they won't even put his name up on the thing. So she is not a, El a Parthenon marble. She is an Elgin marble. She is not displayed um, with the rest of the marbles in the Devine Gallery, but in a place called Gallery 19, which is almost never open, or it hasn't been the last times I have been there, um, and she's sort of by herself. People do tend to um, personify her and her sisters, even the British Museum personifies the sisters. So we tend to speak of them with their pronouns, she, her, um, and she is the figure, I think, that most speaks to Greek poets. I will round up. I know we're over time. Um, I think there's this thing of encountering um, a Greek woman in the British Museum and this feeling, perhaps, of empathy. There is a very young poet, uh, Greek poet Anna Griva, and I came upon this poem by hers. She was born in 1985 called Caryatids, Caryatids. And I thought, okay, is this going to be weird and problematic, what is it going to be about? She says, my friend Maria came here from the Congo 10 years ago. Her sisters remained back in their country. And I thought, where is this going to go? Oftentimes, Greeks will talk about the Caryatids with the idea of exile. These statues are in exile, and British poets as well. Um, her sisters remained back in their country. She is homesick for them and talks constantly about their games and their laughter back when they would run barefoot through the jungle and gathered fruits of all different colors. Maria dreams of the day when she will return there. I am like that caryatid of yours, the one in exile, she said to me one day, and this comparison struck me as strange. How did a statue become a symbol of displacement? How did it become a sisterly memory? How did it define beyond borders and languages, the longing for home. A girl who lives all by herself in a strange place wants to show she is stone, marble unbroken, sparkling, but it only takes a blow to turn it into fragments, innumerable pearls that glow, one beauty scattered to the light. Thank you. That's where she would be.